Picture yourself as a small water bug moving across the surface of a pond. The depths of the water below, impossibly vast for your tiny size, and yet you have the ability to ignore all that lies under because your movement is limited to the surface. That tension is all that keeps your reality from falling apart, though it easily could. All it would take would be for a human to put their hand in the water and to make a splash. All of a sudden, the water that you stood on with such stability has revealed its true form, a chaotic and ever-shifting maelstrom that beings far greater than you can alter on a whim. For the water bug, the hand that disturbs the surface of its small reality is so unknowably large and strong that it is worthy of reverence and abject terror even without any awareness or knowledge of the titanic organism, the human it is connected to and operated by. While we, as humans ourselves, have the capacity to understand this metaphor, it offers us as little consolation as the fact that the water bug can stand on the pond's surface. We were made to call this unstable reality our home and to believe that we are solidly present and important within it. But there are undoubtedly beings within reality that exist beyond our wildest comprehension, and some of them possess hands just like ours. A fearful man in a prison suit arrives at a bus stop with little memory of how he got there. All the prisoner knows is that the road he is on is only a few miles from his hometown, a place that he hasn't seen since his unfortunate turn to a life of crime. Vague recollections of being arrested and institutionalized in a correctional facility seem to cloud his mind, but there are some details of the site he was detained at that seem all too fantastical. Though he was understandably quite anxious about the gaps in his consciousness, the prospect of returning home after all this time filled the prisoner with a sense of warm catharsis. He jogged down the road with an almost celebratory glee, reminded of all the times he did so as a youth. The hard cement beneath his feet felt like miles of silk and lace with how nostalgic it was to be back. The prisoner wondered to himself who would be there waiting for him among his old friends and relatives. He knew his parents wouldn't be there, obviously. But when it came to the townies that he went to school with, there were a few that he knew he had to pay a visit to. The road stretched on in an unusual spiral pattern, but despite that, it was surely the same path that led the prisoner into town. He made it to Main Street in the exact amount of time he thought it would take him, and that was even with the bizarre spiral he ran through on the way there. He thought that perhaps he was only imagining the weirdness of the familiar but unnerving road. Perhaps he was imagining all of it. For a few brief moments, the prisoner's surroundings became a confined and nearly lightless chamber. His first thought was that it was a jail cell, his jail cell. But when he saw what else was inside the containment unit, his mind fumbled for explanations. Within the center of the chamber was a truly enormous human hand. It was not attached to any arm or body of any description, but its errant twitching made it obvious to the prisoner that it was still alive. The prisoner screamed and jumped back, back into the main street of his hometown, which was where he was and also where he had been this entire time, obviously. Perhaps a cup of coffee over at Smith's Diner would take the edge off my nerves, he thought. The route back to his nostalgic teenage hangout was exactly as he'd remembered it. That had to be a good sign. Although when he stepped inside the old diner, things were not as the prisoner had expected. There was nobody sitting at any of the tables, which were once packed every day of the week back in the day. The only other person in the diner was the barista behind the counter, whose face seemed inexplicably hazed in shadow. The prisoner was somehow sure that the barista must have been one of his old friends, who had managed to stay out of trouble and become a key holder at Smith's back during their teenage years. He had always thought that his friend would have a future there throughout his adult years, which, while something that a young person might dread, the prospect of a stable job felt much more ideal now that the prisoner had experienced the consequences of a criminal career. He called out to his friend, who seemed unusually focused on operating the coffee machine, this wouldn't be unusual if there were actually customers in the diner, but their absence made this behavior especially strange. The prisoner was talking loud enough for his friend to hear him, but there was no response. Perhaps a solitary person might be reluctant to acknowledge somebody wearing an orange prisoner jumpsuit, even if they knew them at one time. The prisoner would not be deterred, 
and approached his old friend, banging on the coffee machine itself to get his attention. This did manage to get the barista to look his way, but a wave of regret washed over the prisoner when he realized something was very wrong with his friend. The shadows that strangely clung to the barista's face were swirling like black water going down a drain, a sinking void in place of his head. The prisoner thought he was staring into infinity, but deep inside the dark hole that was his friend's face, he could see that same hand from his previous vision twitching in the darkness. There was something deeply disturbing about this hand, despite or maybe because of it seemed unaware of the prisoner's existence. It was likely related to the strange happenings, but there was no way to reason with it. He turned and ran back for the front door of Smith's diner, convinced that whatever he was looking at was no longer his friend, if it ever was. He barreled through the entrance, and to his discomfort, found himself entering into the same room. The interior was identical to how it was just moments ago, but with the one exception of the barista being gone as well. The prisoner was now feeling an uneasy sense of deja vu. Was this the first time he had entered Smith's diner since he got to town? He couldn't tell, and rather than staying inside and waiting for something more unusual to occur, he left the diner. As soon as he stepped through the door, the memories of seeing his friend, the barista, faded into his subconscious. It couldn't have happened. It was a dream to him. Although at the same time, the prisoner couldn't shake the feeling that he had just been woken up. Given the increasingly disorienting nature of the situation, the prisoner elected to change his approach to exploring this apparently altered version of his hometown. He would go pay a direct visit to the house of one of his teenage acquaintances, hoping to find at least some ordinary people he could talk to. He didn't have a car, so he would have to make the trek on foot. Though being a lifetime criminal meant that the prisoner wasn't above a little Grand Theft Auto, there weren't any cars on the sidewalk to steal. While his hometown was always small in terms of population, it was rarely bustling with activity. The distances between houses because of forestation and agriculture meant that motor vehicles had always been a necessity for the function of the community. To see none of them, and no people either, was not a good omen. The prisoner still remembered the streets well enough and made his way to his cousin's house while shaking off the feeling of encroaching dread and loneliness. Though he had been mostly a friend of circumstance, the prisoner's cousin was one of his oldest and strongest familial bonds. The two of them had even been local nuisances for the cops together, jaywalking and loitering all over town. As opposed to the prisoner, the prisoner's cousin had grown out of committing crime. However, it was likely that his cousin could still be an understanding presence if he could reach him. Unfortunately, there didn't seem to be anyone home at his cousin's house. The prisoner knocked on the front door and back door and checked every window for activity on the inside. The lights were on, but there were no people visible within, let alone the prisoner's cousin. He realized again that his appearance as a jailbird might have been alarming and that the home's occupants could be hiding from him. Then again, he hadn't seen the police or any police cruisers anywhere. Surely if he was thought to be dangerous, somebody in town would have reported him. Right now, even the attention of law enforcement, however unwelcome it would be in most circumstances, would feel like a calmingly normal event. This caused the prisoner's thoughts to spiral again as he became paranoid that nobody had been there to witness him since he had come back to town. What if everyone was gone? Frightened, the prisoner picked a broken chunk of cement off the ground and hurled it through the window of his cousin's house. To his surprise, he was struck from behind by that very same chunk of cement as he looked down at the solid object that he himself had thrown, he heard a sudden noise that sounded like breaking glass. Looking back at the window which he had thrown the rock at, the prisoner saw that the glass had been shattered in a distinctive spiral pattern. The window itself was intact, showing no other signs of damage, but the strange spiral seemed carved almost intentionally. Beyond the now distorted glass, the prisoner could see that the interior of the house had been replaced all at once with an entirely different, but now all too recognizable chamber. It was a dark place with that very same enormous disembodied hand. Without even knowing he had done it, the chunk of cement was once again in the prisoner's hand. Absent-mindedly, he hurled the cement again into the window, this time breaking its surface into a thousand shards. 
the unsettling reflection was gone, and the inside of the house had returned to normal. Or at least, returned to the expected. There was still no sign of the prisoner's cousin, but he had committed to entering the house now. He stepped through the window, unnerved by the lack of an alarm. As the saying goes, it was quiet. Too quiet. He wandered through the familiar house, through darkened hallways and up and down bizarre liminal sets of stairs. It took him a long time to realize that his cousin's house was much larger than he remembered. This was no wonder, as deeper into his delve within the cavernous interior, the prisoner could see that parts of his childhood home had been incorporated into the building. This did not bode well, as his parents' house was the place in town he least wanted to be. But there was no clear way back outside. After ascending a spiral staircase, the prisoner found himself at the door of his parents' bedroom. Somewhere deep in his subconscious, he knew what was waiting for him inside that room. He did not want to open the door. The shadows seemed to grow taller all around him, and as the prisoner turned away from the door, he came face to face with his cousin. Or rather, it was his face looking at a similar void pit to his barista friend where his cousin's head should have been. Within the umbral darkness of his cousin's whole face, the hand seemed to point towards the door. The prisoner looked on in horror as his cousin also pointed towards the door with one of his own hands. He wanted to close his eyes, to deny what was in front of him, but the image persisted and the strange disruptions to his senses only became more pronounced. He was hearing things that should not have been happening, partly because they had already happened long ago. The strained voices of his parents gurgling on their own blood seemed to emanate from behind the door. He could hear bludgeoning sounds that repeated at irregular intervals, drowning out and weakening the voices, but not entirely eliminating them. The prisoner could not close his eyes nor plug his ears. Instead, he was transfixed on the twitching hand. Was it testing him? Did it know everything he knew? If I go in there, they'll die. They'll die because I'm the one who took their lives from them. His thoughts were as loud as the cries of pain, but somehow a message from beyond his perception blared through and reminded him of the truth where he really was. D-34678, get out of there. This is your only lifeline. It was the voice of the warden of his correctional facility. No, they weren't wardens. Researchers. And I'm part of their test. They're testing the hand. As quickly as his fracturing psyche was able to put everything together, the door opened behind him and out stepped a younger version of himself, carrying a bloody aluminum baseball bat. The prisoner looked this other self in the eye, causing a mutual panic between the two. In fear for his future, the young murderer swung the bat and hit the strange older man in the prison jumper hard in the skull. There can't be witnesses, he thought, making sure that his handiwork was fatal. The prisoner did not survive, and apparently neither did his younger self. When the research team from SCP Foundation Site-22 entered the containment chamber, they found that D-34678 had beaten his own body into disrepair with a blunt instrument that had never physically existed. D-34678's entire phantasmal return to his hometown and his subsequent accidental death being an incident that happened entirely because of the distorted reality of SCP-5688. The giant hand, measuring three meters tall and one meter wide, is a Euclid-class object that, while animate, does not appear to possess an active psyche. The only movements that SCP-5688 has been known to display are entirely random nerve spasms, which can neither be predicted nor provoked. The hand was discovered beneath Site-22, entirely buried in the dirt and rock of the Earth's crust. It is currently unknown how long the hand had been lying dormant in the place of its discovery, and the only reason that it was unearthed was a planned expansion to the subterranean containment portion of Site-22. The construction project was completed, and SCP-5688 was placed inside one of the newly built containment units. Experiments into the nature of SCP-5688 have revealed that it has an ambient reality-warping effect on its surroundings. Usually, this is limited to the chamber where it has been stored, and for that reason, it is meant to remain there so that containment procedures can be upheld. 
The variance and severity of reality warping that occurs during interaction with SCP-5688 is still being extensively researched through the use of D-Class personnel. While the hand doesn't inflict any direct violence upon the test subjects, there have been a number of casualties among the D-Class due to the completely unpredictable nature of SCP-5688's effects on reality. D-34678's assignment had merely been to observe SCP-5688 uninterrupted for as long as possible, and the unexplained bludgeoning that resulted in his death was only one of the many ways that the altered reality could have manifested. Curiously, another D-Class, D-7452, had been assigned to puncture the flesh of SCP-5688 with a spear in order to see if the hand would defend itself from attack. The results were ultimately inconclusive, as the spear was unable to make contact with SCP-5688. The wood and metal twisting into a spiral shape, along with several of D-7452's fingers. D-7452 felt no pain during the transmutation of his digits, but nonetheless required corrective surgery to detach his hand from the spear. These results raise one of the most unusual pieces of information regarding SCP-5688's reality warping properties, that being the prevalence of spiral patterns. Whether it is the appearance of spiraling shadows or objects becoming bent and reshaped into a spiral formation, it is oddly common for the hand tamperings to repeat this modification. Though there doesn't appear to be a root cause behind the consistent appearance of these spirals, it does suggest that SCP-5688 is not fully chaotic and random in the way that it influences reality. Perhaps the spiral is somehow linked to the Fibonacci sequence, a recursive mathematical sequence that is associated with the golden ratio, an underlying symmetry that is believed to indicate the universal beauty of visual phenomena. Others might say that spirals are a lot more inherently unnerving, as the idea of endless recursion implies an inescapable and hypnotic eternity. The intentions, if any, behind the hand's affinity for spirals cannot be discerned at this time. Though spirals are far from the only trick up the sleeve of SCP-5688's non-existent arm, as it has the ability to trap those who interact with it in impressionist mind prisons that are imperceptible from the outside. Within these delusional sub-realities, almost anything can happen, or at the same time, not happen. The rules of time and space are suspended, and this can result in a number of alterations that cannot be replicated or conceived of outside of describing the results of the test. In a test involving one D-Class, the subject both died in a gratuitous explosive fashion and yet also lived through the experiment, albeit trapped in an inaccessible state of suspended sleep. Both results were recorded by the Foundation, and both are effectively true, with the research team present at Site-22 recalling both events with perfect clarity. SCP-5688 has the uncanny ability to allow contradictory outcomes to occur within the same moment and span of time. Measuring and cataloging the numerous effects of SCP-5688's reality distortion are certainly the primary source of research into the Euclid-class object, but there is a secondary purpose to the tests that are being conducted. Dr. Henrik, a veteran researcher of Site-22, has been adamant about acquiring a functional DNA sample from SCP-5688. Though attempts to extract such a sample have proved to be a Herculean task, the importance of this endeavor is paramount to Dr. Henrik. Ever since a brush with SCP-5688's tendency to create pocket realities, Dr. Henrik has been reasonably convinced that the hand is somehow a replication or alternate universe variant of his own hand. This theory does not have much in the way of proof outside of Dr. Henrik's testimony on his own experience with the hand, as well as the experiment log that was updated without the knowledge of any member of the research team. An inference could be made about the location of SCP-5688's discovery and that its proximity to Site-22 could imply a connection between Dr. Henrik and the hand. This wouldn't be the first time that an SCP was believed to have been brought into existence as a result of a researcher being exposed to warped reality especially if the theory that connects SCP-106, the old man, and Dr. Robert Scranton is to be believed. SCP-5688 might be another SCP that was created as an incidental result of the Foundation's research. Alternatively, SCP-5688 may be the fate that awaits Dr. Henrik after an event that has yet to occur in our reality. 
the third party responsible, whether it is a conscious force or not, would be the unknown catalyst of SCP-5688's existence. Maybe the event that turned the hapless Dr. Henrik's hand into SCP-5688 will never actually occur in our reality, but did fully and irrevocably occur in its own version of reality. While this might be good news for Dr. Henrik, as he won't need to fear for the safety of his limbs, it also means SCP-5688 exists and will continue to exist regardless of anything the Foundation can do. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-513, a cowbell.